Welcome to Strip Cover Lit, where we squeeze the bigger picture of literature. I am Adrian Fort, and we are here for the fourth in a 138-part series as we journey in a yeoman-like fashion through You Get So Alone at Times That It Just Makes Sense by Charles Bukowski. You get so alone at times that what just makes sense? Well, if you have to ask, then I'm afraid you'll never understand. This poem titled Working It Out. And it is a uh, special episode for me because the poem with which I am contrasting Working It Out by Charles Bukowski is one that I like um, a good deal better than the Bukowski poem, and that is the first time in this series that that has happened, though I have considerably liked all of the poems that have been presented in contrast with Bukowski. It is different, uh, in fact, to say that I like them more especially because this is a collection of poetry that I found at a time that was very crucial to me. Uh, Post-grad school, pre-strip cover lit, I was in a bit of a flux with what it meant to have literature in my life, and um, there were times where I, I was so lonely that it did make sense. And ironically, that is a bit of the predicament we're here to discuss today. So, working it out reads as such. In this steamy AM, Hades claps its herpes hands and a woman sings through my radio. Her voice comes clamoring through the smoke and the wine fumes. It's a lonely time. She sings and you're not mine and it makes me feel so bad. This thing of being me. I can hear her car I can hear cars on the freeway. It's like a distant sea sludged with people, while over my other shoulder, far over the over on Seventh Street, near Western, is the hospital. That house of agony, sheets and bedpans, and arms and heads and expirations. Everything is so sweetly awful, so continuously and sweetly awful. The art of consummation, life eating life. Once, in a dream, I saw a snake swallowing its own tail. It swallowed and swallowed until it got halfway round, and there it stopped, and there it stayed. It was stuffed with its own self. Some fix that. We only have ourselves to go on, and it's enough. I go downstairs for another bottle, switch on the cable, and there's Greg Peck pretending he's F. Scott, and he's very excited, and he's reading his manuscript to his lady. I turn the set off. What kind of writer is that, reading his pages to a lady? This is a violation. I return upstairs, and my two cats follow me. They are fine fellows. We have no discontent. We have no arguments. We listen to the same music. Never vote on a president. One of my cats, the big one, leaps on the back of my chair, rubs against my shoulders and neck. No good, I tell him. I am not going to read you this poem. He leaps to the floor and walks out on the balcony with his buddy, and his buddy follows. They sit and watch the night. We've got the power of sanity here. These early a.m. mornings when almost everybody is asleep, small night bugs, winged things, enter and circle and whirl. The machine hums its electric hum, and having opened and tasted the new bottle, I type the next line. You can read it to your lady, and she'll probably tell you it's nonsense. She'll be reading Tender is the Night. We are comparing and contrasting that poem with Invictus by William Hurst Henley. Uh, Invictus reads as such. Pardon me, my uh, beverages are catching up with me. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloodied, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms the horror of the shade. 
and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And it appears to me that what we've got going on here is loneliness forcing reflection on the forever. Not mortality, but the forever. Forever forth, what is next, whatever there might be, the forever forever, the forever and always. Not mortality, not the end, but how it is this life and the loneliness therein that suffers consequence to eternity. For Henley, this comes at night, which is fairly standard. Um, night and persecution often go hand in hand. Self-persecution and night often go hand in hand. Uh, and it is in that scene that we find Henley, who is uh, unconquerable, and self-admittedly so. Unconquerable compared to Tinder in Bukowski. Tinder is the night. Henley is unconquerable. Those which are unconquerable tend not to be Tinder. This in itself is a statement of difference. For Bukowski, the early a.m. in his poem seems to be between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m., somewhere in there, but we're still hearing cars on the highway. This is not a time of still awake for Bukowski. It is a time of now awake for Bukowski. Whereas Henley, in his poem, seems to be resigned to the night, in order to be alone, Bukowski is awake at night, is alive at night, is prime at night. Prime time is the night time for Bukowski, and that is expressed in these poems, uh, which further differentiates Bukowski from a classic voice. Moving on, Henley invokes whatever gods may be. Uh, in a poem that is often claimed by atheists, he follows through by um, proclaiming to be the captain of his soul. Now, Henley, it should be noted, was alive 1849 to 1903, the last time that the proposition around the last time, somewhere in that time frame, that the proposition of God could be claimed to be a scientific verity. Now, everything with... Now, I'm not saying you can't be religious today, but it is less scientifically thorough. If you want to make claims based on your religion, claims based on your religion are claims outside of science, not claims correlating therewith. During the time of Henley, this was still the intellectually honest argument that God coin coincided with science. Um, shortly thereafter, things started to take a turn, and science and God split ways. That being said, this stance by Henley, whatever gods may be, might be the furthest one could intellectually go with honesty um, against religion. Not claiming uh, Yahweh, look at me, I'm not yours. Not stating Christ, look, you might have been a nice fella, but you're not for me, stating straight out whatever gods might be. Whatever gods might be was one hell of a proposition uh, at the time that Henley lived. Bukowski, instead of invoking whatever gods might be and claiming his own independence, 
goes straight to Hades. Um, and instead of being independent, it is through the wrath of loneliness. And the captain of his soul, we have a snake in Bukowski. We have a snake eating itself, which is a semi-Sisyphean symbol uh, of fate that is out of our hands. Fate, which is the same thing forever. Endeavor, endeavor, and ever. And you don't get to choose. That is from where Bukowski is making this claim. Um, but I think the main thrust here should go towards the final stanzas when we're really looking at these things. For Hindley, the final stanza reads as such. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. This is a man staking claim to solitude. Um, and perhaps, not perhaps, this is a man who is ripping the statements of prominence and power from whatever gods might be, whatever gods there might be. Um, this is a man not shunning authority, but condemning it. I am the captain of my soul. No matter what you've got written on those scrolls of my life, I am the captain of my soul. No matter how straight the gate, I am the master of my fate. Um, this is fierce ownership of consequence. Fierce ownership of consequence. I don't care what your rules say. You were not straight forth enough with them. You were not straight forth enough with them. I don't care what you say. I lived my life the way I did. I lived my life the best I saw fit. Do what you're going to. But no matter what you do, you can't make me suffer the way Sisyphus suffered. You can't make me cower. I refuse. Which is another reason why this is often claimed by atheists and recited by atheists, because um, one of the... Oh, I can't remember who it was. Hitchens was often asked, uh, if you die and you find yourself at the gates of heaven and God comes to you with shoulders raised, what are you going to say? And he was quoting someone, but I can never remember who it was. Um, and Hitchens said, quoting this other person, you didn't give me enough evidence. I don't know what you wanted from me. That is the same stance that Henley is taking. Bukowski's last stanza reads as such. These early a.m. mornings when almost everybody is asleep, small night bugs, winged things, enter and circle and whirl. The machine hums its electric hum, having opened and tasted the new bottle, I type the next line. You can read it to your lady and she'll probably tell you it's nonsense. She'll be reading Tinder is the Night. This is a man staking claim to solace and individuality and perhaps sass. Authority? Bukowski doesn't even believe in it. Bukowski's so edgy, he's forsaking partnership. Screw your lady. He would if he was given the chance. Bukowski doesn't really believe in anyone having claim over him. 
All he knows is the eternal suffering. We have that regurgitation, if you will, of the circle symbol. Earlier, that circle was the snake eating itself, that symbol of forever, that symbol of Sisyphean suffering. Here, small night bugs, winged things, enter and circle and whirl. They don't know any better. They circle and whirl because it is what they are pre-programmed to do. People do much the same thing in their lives. This is not a fierce ownership of consequence the way Henley had been. Instead, it is an um, improper justification for jealousy. Jealousy being a fierce claim to those things which one owns already against those which do not. A jealous lover is jealous because the lover is his or hers, and others might want that. This poetry belongs to Bukowski. It is his sweet thing. He doesn't want others to have it. It is therefore an improper justification for jealousy. No one is there to sully your poetry, Bukowski. So, when threatened alone with forever and ever and ever, Henley says, bring it. Give me what you got. Let's go. I can do this all day. Bukowski says, hey, keep it. Keep it over there. I got this going on over here. You can have that going on over there. Let's keep these separate forevers. And that is perhaps another way to know Bukowski and be in that sweet church of Chucky Buck. That is all I have for these pairings, this pairing of poems. Um, I'm an idiot and I closed my book, but I hope to have you back for the next episode of this series, Alone with Bukowski, as we tackle Beasts Bounding Through Time, a, an episode which has thus far given me fits. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I hope to have you there for it. Uh, make sure you hit that like button if you like this sort of thing. Hit subscribe if you want me to keep popping up in your suggested feed. And if you would like to help me grow here on Strip Coverlet, be sure to share this with someone who uh, likes Bukowski, perhaps is an atheist, something like that.